Alright guys, BLM here back with a new video. In this video, I'll be talking about one of my favorite games from the year of 2020, and that is Final Fantasy VII Remake. Now we are near the one year anniversary of the game, so I thought now was the perfect time to talk about it because I haven't been able to talk about it yet. Now obviously, I, ideally I would have done this video like a year ago, <laughs> like immediately after the game came out, but I didn't end up playing it until a few months after its release, so this felt like the right time. I mean, this is after my first replay of the game, and I will say I really liked the game the first time I played it, despite having one massive flaw with the game, and that is the amount of filler that was added to the game, but while I still have that flaw coming out of this replay, I did grow a further appreciation for the game especially from a narrative perspective. I mean, like, to be honest, I don't really understand what was going on for a good chunk of the end game on my original playthrough, but now knowing what's going on, now understanding the ramifications that this has on future installments, it really bolstered the respect that I have for this game to the point where now this is a serious game of the year contender for me, and I do still at some point plan on doing a video on the games of 2020 where I rank all the games I've played from that year and when I eventually get around to doing that I mean this game will be pretty high up there. Now before we talk about the game itself I feel like we might as well talk about my experience with the original game. And coming into my first playthrough of the remake here I had very little experience with the original game. Obviously I knew about characters like Cloud, Sephiroth, Aerith, and Tifa but not really much about them outside of like the basic concepts of those characters. Now years ago I did end up playing the first couple hours of the original PS1 version of the game but at this point I don't really remember much of it. However in the time between then and my first playthrough I did watch a story summary at some point so I had a basic idea of where the story was going. Obviously not the very in-depth details of every little thing here and there, but like I knew the general direction. And knowing the type of narrative that this was, plus also the gameplay that we saw from previous press conferences, like I knew this was going to be a game that would be for me. And once I finally got around to playing it, it definitely didn't disappoint. To the point where it made me really interested in replaying the original game to kind of get a sense of the differences between the two. Now I have not had the time to actually play the original game again for myself however since my most recent replay i did actually watch the beginning of a let's play to the original game where i watched through the entire midgar section to fully appreciate the changes that they made between the original and the remake now let's talk about the actual game itself obviously from the name you can gather that it is a remake of final fantasy 7 however it isn't the entirety of it essentially this is only part one with the other parts coming down the road. I mean, this part covers the Midgar section of the original game, which is essentially the first like four or five hours of a like 30 hour game. So it is ridiculous how much they expanded upon those first few hours of the original game to make it its own game around the same length as that original game. It's insane when you watch footage of the original game and see the comparisons between the two because just taking out the aspect of this being a remake, it's still one of the best modern RPGs I've played. I mean, the scale of the narrative that's trying to tell is really impressive, especially with how much they added from the original game. And through that, they really expanded the world building of Midgar here. Graphically, this game is beautiful and makes the city of Midgar feel really alive. The combat system is a really fun mix of elements you would expect from a turn-based RPG and also an action RPG. Pretty much everything that I personally would have wanted from Final Fantasy VII Remake here, it gave me. But the biggest issue is that it gave me more than I actually wanted, which ends up really bloating the game. Now the game for the most part is a linear game. The game is broken up into chapters and most of those chapters are just a straight shot. But there are some chapters that act as a semi-open world where you can interact with the world, go to shops, do some side quests, and this is cool. Again, it makes the world feel more alive in a way that the original game couldn't even compare. However, with that being said, I never cared for how the side quests are structured within this game. Most of them just serve as padding to the game where they don't really add much narratively and just feel like the standard boring fetch quests or clear out an area sort of quests that just get really tedious. 
And while I did do these missions the first time I played the game, on the replay here, I just didn't feel incentivized to do them. But now let's talk about the combat system, which is fantastic, just as great as I expected it to be. It feels like they took the combat system of something like Final Fantasy 15 and mixed it in with elements of the original Final Fantasy 7. You do have an ATB meter that increases with every attack, and once it's filled, you can freeze time and use the command menu in order to use your special attacks or use magic or potions, which again was a nice way to mix the two combat approaches. There are also summons in this game, which I'll be honest, the first time I played the game, I didn't know how to use them. I didn't realize that after summoning, well, Infrit is the one that I use most often, that you actually had to use the summon abilities in order for it to essentially do anything, as essentially that's the main way to deal damage with your summons. So like my initial playthrough, I would just use the summons, but not really do anything with them. But obviously I rectified that towards the end of that playthrough and then obviously during my most current one. You do also have a limit break meter that once filled allows you to do a finisher attack. Kind of standard stuff there, again carried over from the original game. Something I love about this game though is that you can switch between party members, each of them having a completely different play style. Cloud is the most balanced of the bunch and you can use his Buster Blade which feels very satisfying to use. Tifa uses these really quick melee attacks, Barret uses ranged attacks though he moves relatively slow, and Aerith can also only use ranged attacks but also focuses around using magic. Though unlike most other RPGs, you can't actually select your party within this game, it is preset based on where you are within the story. Now I do think they do a decent job within the narrative to explain why the group is separated at points though there are some points where it's like why can't I use Barrett he's like literally standing right there but now let's talk about the narrative starting off with the characterization in the game which is radically different from the original where in the original there was obviously no voice acting we just got text bubbles on the screen and through that it's a lot harder to give characters depth especially depth that we see in many modern games and I think the modernization of this game's story really allows for these characters to be shown in a more complex way take the main protagonist in Cloud as an example where in the original game just through reading the dialogue you get the sense that he is this like overly confident unemotional figure but in this game we do see him break that facade to Tifa and Aerith through the game that you notice through his acting not necessarily the actual dialogue that he's given. Tifa is another character given more depth in this game with her rationale for taking down Shinra being further explored along with the complexity that comes with her trying to do so peacefully. I like how they handled the relationship between Barret and Cloud which includes some pretty fun banter. Aerith is a character that I will admit even before this game I always preferred Tifa over Aerith and I never loved her characterization in the little of what I played of the original game but I think her character is given more depth here as well and you do get the sense that she obviously knows a lot more about what is going on than she is leading on to. And I also like how this game expands upon the stories of the other Avalanche members, Jesse especially, as again, it gives those characters more depth. It gives Cloud some character development through his interactions with them, and it also expands the world building of Midgar through their adventures that he goes on with them. I was also surprised at how much Sephiroth is in this game, considering he never appears in the Midgar section of the original game, but I did like how they handled him here, especially because it's kind of dumb to hide the character like they did in the original game, considering how iconic of a figure he is now, and how like everyone that knows anything about Final Fantasy VII knows about Sephiroth so it seems kind of weird to keep him as this mysterious antagonist when it's like we know who he is. I did really like the voice acting in this game as well. I thought Cloud in particular was well acted with Cody Christian still keeping that cool calm and collected aspect of Cloud's character while adding more personality to the character. Obviously there's still these dumb cheesy moments you would expect from any JRPG and with this being directed by Tetsuya Nomura you definitely get some Kingdom Hearts vibes from the dialogue and certain elements of the story. But now let's talk about the main narrative itself and let's run through the chapters of the game. Chapter 1 starts off pretty similarly to the original game with pretty similar shots and camera movements that were there in the opening of the original game and this serves as a pretty perfect tutorial to the combat system of the game while also including us the cloud along with the other avalanche members without making it feel like we've missed out on a lot of their interactions beforehand as we're told that this is cloud's first job with the group. We do end up helping Avalanche blow up a Mako reactor, in turn helping them in their fight against Shinra, who is this really generically evil corporation that runs Midgar. Chapter 2 involves Cloud's return to Sector 7, which along the way he meets Aerith, and we also get our first hallucinations of Sephiroth, which lead to some really cool visuals, and I really love the music that's played here, it really sets the tone really well. We also get introduced to the Whisperers here 
which are easily the most fascinating part of the overall story of the remake as these are original to the remake here and end up showing up every time something starts to happen that didn't occur in the original storyline. And it seems that these entities are there to try to keep the timeline the same. And I will admit, I didn't fully understand what was going on with them the first time I played the game. Again, without a great memory of the original games, I was actually thinking that the Whispers were part of the original game. So it wasn't until my second playthrough that I fully appreciated what they were doing narratively here. Again, they're a really cool addition to the story, and we'll definitely talk a lot more about them later on. But overall, I do feel like Chapter 2 went on for a bit too long, especially the back portion of it where you're just fighting numerous groups of guards one after the other. It just gets kind of tedious. But that leads to Chapter 3, which is a really long one that has Cloud return to the Sector 7 slums. We get introduced to Tifa, and our adventures with her are way longer than they were in the original game. But the section also serves as a tutorial to the side quests in the game. And because of that, you do spend a lot of this chapter doing tasks that aren't really that important to the overall plot. But it does give you a strong sense of Tifa's character, so I guess I don't absolutely hate it. Chapter 4 does revolve around the new side narrative with the Avalanche members that, as I mentioned before, further explore Jesse in particular as a character. And again, while this doesn't really progress the main story that much, it does build upon those characters, so overall I'm pretty content with this section as well. Then we get to chapters 5 through 7, which return to the main story, revolving around another bombing. But something I did love here is again the appearance of the Whispers before the start of the job, where initially Cloud wasn't going to go on the job, which obviously in the original game he did. So the Whispers end up injuring Jesse to correct the timeline. Again, another really cool aspect of the story here. But this section does involve traveling through the train tunnels, then doing this puzzly section to get to the reactor, and then... At the actual reactor itself, we get a series of battles followed by a massive boss battle. Like, all this does feel like kind of a bloated section. Again, three chapters just to reach the reactor and escape. It feels a bit too much, in my opinion. Though I did enjoy the process of getting to the boss battle, where the game gives you choices that allow you to weaken the boss in different ways, and I thought that was an interesting way to make this slog of enemies more interesting to get through. The chapter ends with us falling into the Sector 5 slums, conveniently landing in the abandoned church that Aerith uses as a greenhouse. And chapter 8 feels pretty similar to chapter 3, but instead of focusing around Tifa, we spend the entire time with Aerith and act as her bodyguard, and we get introduced to the Turks and have some boss battles along the way with them. We do get introduced to Aerith's mom, but again, everything outside of that does feel like filler. Again, it bolsters the world building, but harms the overall focus of the narrative in my eyes. But this does lead us to chapter 9. Again, another one of the longer arcs in the game where Aerith helps us return to Sector 7. And we get this pretty long section of going through the underground. And that involves some puzzles and some combat sections. But eventually we reach Sector 6, which is where we get our first reference to Zack in a scene very reminiscent to the original game. But conveniently, right before we enter Sector 7, we see this carriage enter Sector 6 with Tifa in the back of it. And this leads to us reaching Wall Market and dealing with Don Corneo. And I will say that this is easily my least favorite part of the entire game. While this plot line did actually occur in the original game, it really just feels like filler to the story, even in the original, but here they bloat it even more by adding this element of getting the endorsement of Corneo's trio, and then we have to win this fighting tournament, along with us also winning this dance-off, and it's like, this all felt really pointless. And again, with this section being really long, this really halted the narrative for me, which ends up being one of my biggest issues with Final Fantasy VII Remake here is that, again, the beginning of the game is really strong. Like, while there is filler in chapters 3 and 4, it's still a section of the game that I really enjoy, and the same thing goes for the back portion of the game as well. But it's this middle section of the game that drags so much that really harms my overall experience with the game. To be honest, I think if this section of the game didn't exist, this would very clearly be my number one game of the year. But because of how mediocre this section of the game is in my eyes, it does really hold it back. And also just tonally within the game, I don't feel like this section really works. I mean, again, it very much feels like something you would expect from like Kingdom Hearts, like this wacky, goofy section of the game. But when the remainder of the game takes itself pretty seriously, this definitely feels like an outlier. So overall, I just really did not like this section of the game. But it's through this chapter that we learn about Shinra's plan to destroy the plate 
make it collapse onto the Sector 7 slums, and through that we do spend chapters 10 and 11 returning to Sector 7, which again feels like filler, even though again this was technically in the main game, but it's obviously very much expanded, where chapter 10 takes place within the sewers, and chapter 11 takes place th within the train graveyard. Again, another pretty slow section for me, but the game does really pick up after this, as when we reach chapter 12, everything from that point forward is pretty great. I mean, yeah, there's still the filler here and there, especially in that section before we head towards the Shinra headquarters, but this is still an overall really great section of the game. We have Cloud and Tifa trying to stop the falling of the plate and failing to do so, while Aerith helps the people below, which leads to her getting captured by Shinra. We do get a pretty awesome boss battle here with Reno and Rude. And I also love what they did with the Whispers here where they try to ensure the deaths of Biggs and Jesse. With the Jesse farewell feeling really impactful due to how much you connect with her character earlier on in the game. Though obviously knowing the story of the original game, I knew it was coming. But I did also find it interesting that Wedge ends up surviving this as in the original game, he didn't. Though obviously that gets rectified later in the game. Chapters 13 and 14 focus around the aftermath of the plate falling, and this section is great at building a sense of desperation and despair as we walk through the crowds of survivors and the wreckage, and this is all really great. I mean, I didn't love the section where we find the Shinra lab, and again, that very much felt like filler, but I did have some interesting gameplay sections there with Cloud being out of the picture for most of it and us having to play as Barrett, so we had to blast our way through the lab. And I thought that section was pretty interesting, but the only interesting narrative ramification of this is the inclusion of, again, the Whispers trying to stop Cloud from finding out information too early, which again is a really fun plot device throughout this game. We do also learn a bit about Aerith's background, but also in this section, we do end up meeting back up with Don Corneo, and this was pretty bad. I really did not like this section. Again, Pretty much everything involving Don Corneo for me was really boring and really dragged out. I still found this section really, really tedious. I mean, the chasing of Corneo's pig was just really dumb and added nothing to the story. So while this section obviously wasn't nearly as long as that stretch of chapters 9, 10, and 11, like, this definitely was another, like, minor low point here. But eventually we get to the point of no return, which is the start of chapter 15, which starts the road to the Shinra headquarters. And this is a very platforming and combat heavy section that will drag a bit, but it's pretty interesting from a set piece point of view. And overall, I don't have many complaints with this section. After that, we do reach chapter 16, which is the start of the infiltration. And this has some really weird sections within it, like a Tifa platforming section. And also you have this section where you have to go up 59 floors. And this was in the original game as well, where you can either choose to go by the stairs or through the elevator with the stairs being a pretty weird option considering you literally have to climb up 59 flight of stairs and there's some fun banter here and there but it does feel weird that that's actually part of the game as i feel like with most other games they would just have you like start on the first few floors and then they would cut to you at the top but here you actually have to climb all those stairs but we eventually reach Aerith and get introduced to Hojo and we learn that Aerith is a descendant of a precursor race. And we also get introduced to Red 13 who is a talking animal thing, wolf dog thing. I know in the original game he is an actual party member but here he's just a guest character and isn't controllable. I'm assuming that's going to change with future installments but we'll see. I did find it interesting that he is actually the first one to actually tell us what the Whispers are and how they ensure that the course of destiny isn't altered. And again, this leaves so many questions about how they came to be, what timeline are we currently in, how does this affect the storyline moving forward, but sadly those are all answers that we're going to have to wait for future installments. We do then get to chapter 17, which is a pretty long section of getting through Hojo's lab, which involves the group getting split up and you having to use Red 13 to navigate through the area, and this section does go on a bit too long. But there are some pretty great story moments here, like when Hojo is about to reveal the cloud about his past and the whispers cut him off. We get Sephiroth appearing through one of his clones and seeing him kill the president of Shinra. We have Barrett also being killed by Sephiroth, but him being revived by the whispers, obviously because that wasn't supposed to happen. We also see the whispers kill Wedge, correcting the storyline there. And we also just get a series of boss battles where we first fight against Genova, which is a more standard boss battle, like kind of functions the way that you would expect. After that, we do get a great one-on-one -on -one fight with Rufus, which is a fun, really cinematic fight there. And then we get the final boss of Chapter 17, which kind of sucks. I mean, you have the fight playing as Barrett and 
Aerith, and again, I know this was in the original game, but when you're playing in an action RPG as two characters that can only do ranged attacks, again, not having a melee fighter there, it really does take this fight for ever the finish and that was something that i did find kind of annoying but we do end up escaping from the headquarters and this leads to the final chapter chapter 18 which starts with a chase sequence which serves as the last bit of the game that mirrors the original game because everything after this is essentially original content where at the end of the expressway sephiroth awaits them and this leads to the first boss battle of the end game here against the Whisper Harbinger, which is a really cool boss battle. The scale of this fight is really impressive, but narratively, this is also really interesting because with the defeat of the Whispers here, you get rid of this entity that had been correcting the storyline over and over and over again throughout the game here. And I do feel like this could lead to some really interesting plot points moving forward because essentially by doing this, they are telling you that we have the freedom to change up the story from the original game. And I think that brings some interesting questions of what those changes are going to be moving forward. But then we get to the final boss battle in the game with us taking on Sephiroth and, and we have Cloud turning down his offer to forge a new destiny together. And Cloud does end up being defeated by him. But I do feel like this was the best way to end the game here with Cloud still having to hunt down Sephiroth, take him down, which does leave us in a similar point in the story to where the Midgar section ended in the original game. Though we do end this game with this really mind-blowing ending that I will be honest, I did not fully understand what was going on here the first time I played it. But now, knowing what this Zack Fair reveal means of him surviving the attack, that killed him in the original storyline. This is a fantastic setup for a sequel here. So that and also the reveal that Biggs also survived the collapse as well. I am really excited to see how these changes affect the storyline of the remake moving forward, especially because from what I understand, it's already been confirmed that the Zack Fair that survived is actually from another timeline. So that means that there's three timelines that we are aware of now. So how does he end up affecting the remake continuity? I think that's an interesting question. Obviously, I'm assuming that we're going to get some mixing of timelines, which I think could obviously convolute the story moving forward. But I also think it could lead to some really interesting plot points. And because of that, I am really hyped for part two of Final Fantasy VII Remake here, probably more than any other game at this current point. But there we go. I mean, that, those are most of my opinions on Final Fantasy VII Remake one year after its initial release. Well, obviously, I do do a bit of complaining in this video, particularly about the pacing of the middle section of the game. I do still love this game despite the ridiculous amount of filler for me this is still a serious contender for my 2020 game of the year with its grand narrative it's really fun combat system and it's really likable characters now as i said i'm really really excited for part two and definitely will be playing it when it comes out possibly doing a video on it but obviously that's for down the road also at some point i would like to do a 2020 year in gaming video obviously similar to my 2019 year in gaming video for last year but this time with the games of 2020 so stay tuned for that but for now those are my thoughts on final fantasy 7 remake thank you for watching